Well, greetings from Australia, from the other side of the Pacific. I uh, hope things are going well. Um, I have very good memories of the original conference 20 years ago, back in 1998. And I got a great deal out of that conference, and as other people did. And I hope this one goes as well. So, I'm sorry I can't be with you in the flesh, but with the miracle of electronic communication, we'll do our best. And I hope that you have two good days from now on. I became involved in, in research on men, masculinities and boys, basically as a result of the impact of the, the women's liberation movement and the gay liberation movement in the, Anglers, the Anglophone world. Um, movements that challenged existing understandings of, of power and oppression by pointing to the need to understand those, those issues in, in new ways. Now, of course, this wasn't the first time there'd been talk about gender issues, indeed about men and about masculinities. Uh, but there was a, a fairly <coughs> widespread conventional view at the time that what it was to be a man was sort of laid down, was fixed either by God or by nature. Um, and similarly, what it was to be a woman was, as the Germans put it, uh, to be concerned with Kinder, Kirche und Kirche, um, children, the church and, and the kitchen. Uh, and those were just fixed in, in human nature one way or the other. But by then there was a, a more radical view, uh, which was expressed in, in those social movements, that masculinity and femininity were socially defined, um, were learned, in fact, uh, and were, could be understood in terms of role theory. So there was a, a language of male and female sex roles which were defined in, in a given society by, by norms, by uh, doctrines of what uh, masculinity and femininity ought to be, how people ought to behave, and sanctions applied to people who failed to conform to the, the male role or the female role. Now, <coughs> that was a view popularised um, in the social movements of the 1970s, but also challenged because those movements also show the inadequacy of role thinking. Uh, because it became very clear, for instance, out of gay liberation movement, that there was not just one version of the male role, but there were multiple ways of, of being a man um, and, and relationships between them. There were livable ways of being a gay man. And similarly, feminism, uh, as it diversified or recognised the diversity that was always there, uh, also began to recognise different ways of, different forms of, of the male role, or different norms about masculinity, different classes, for instance. But both of those movements, all the social movements of that time, in fact, also highlighted the issue of power. And that was a fundamental issue that role theory could not theorise well. So the question of how power relations and the capacity for oppression were actually sustained over time remained as an unsolved problem at that time. And that was where the Gramsci's notion of hegemony was recognised as, as useful and it became possible to think of masculinity, or at least particular forms of masculinity, as having a hegemonic role in the reproduction of a patriarchal gender order. And that was basically where the concept of hegemonic masculinity came from. So that was the, <clears throat> the framework, if you like, in which the early um, research on men and masculinities was launched in the context of a shift towards social definitions, but a bit of a struggle over what kind of social theory would be adequate. In the 1990s, 
the research which had been launched on men and masculinities actually emerged as a co reasonably coherent field of, of research and, and conceptual debate and was obviously under construction globally, not just in specific, in particular milieu. And I want to show you this with some of the, the significant um, publications of the time. In Germany, for instance, uh, which had been one of the pioneers in the 1980s of feminist research on men and masculinities. We had uh, books like this collection of critical studies on masculinities uh, in Peru, uh, of course, as you will know, the work of Norma Fulier, who I understand is going to be with you. Um, in South Africa, at much the same time, in 1997, there was an important pioneering conference, the first conference on studies of masculinities in Africa, which produced a few years later this book, and you can see how the cover captures the idea of diversity in masculinities. In Brazil, um, work by Margareta Ria, uh, who was at that uh, 1998 conference, and her colleagues uh, began putting together a range of studies of the situations of men, boys, and, and masculinities. In Japan, pioneering social research by colleagues like Taga Futoshi, uh, who produced this monograph on, on the construction of masculinity among middle-class men uh, at much the same time. And of course, at the same time, there was work going on in Australia, in Chile, um, and, and we, we saw basically a global discourse about men and masculinities uh, be emerging. Uh, and with it, some of the academic practicalities of, of new fields of study. So we had journals being founded, uh, we had university courses taught, we had research projects being funded, and we had conferences being convened, and international exchange of ideas and research results uh, became possible. We could say then that this is the moment when a global field of of research and discussion consolidates. Now, we should also remember the practicality, the, the, not just the academic practicalities, but the wider circumstances in which that was happening. So, at the beginning of the 1990s, we saw the end of the Cold War and the end of the Cold War dictatorships in Russia, um, in a number of countries in Latin America, in South Africa, the apartheid regime came, was coming to an end. In East and Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, for instance, the, uh, the Cold War dictatorship of the New Order there uh, was coming to an end. Um, and in those circumstances, it was easy to think, and, and I think we did think at, at that time, that there were real possibilities for a new gender order, a more democratic gender order, on a global scale. Um, that a new politics of gender relations was emerging. Uh, was not just possible, but it's actually with us. And as part of that, part of the discourse that was coming out of the research and conceptual debate was the idea of new forms of masculinity, new ways of being a man, that were now in view, that were practically possible. But at the same time, we also have to recognize that that was the moment of the, the Washington consensus, of the rapid global spread of the neoliberal model of economics and politics, which had been pioneered in Chile, in other parts of Latin America, and then in Britain and the United States. So a civil neoliberalism was replacing authoritarian neoliberalism and that took with it, that had with it a gender project of shifting resources from public sectors in the interests of women to private sectors where the economic interests of men were more represented 
Okay, I now want to say something about what's happened in the field in the 20 years since our, our previous conference. Um, basically, uh, the field that had been formed, the global field of research and discussion that had been formed in the 1980s, in, from the 1980s and especially in the 1990s, uh, it matured as, as a research field. Uh, the volume of research has increased quite significantly. Uh, research and the uptake, the recognition of research. So as a, a small example of that, if you, if you look up uh, my book Masculinities in uh, Google Scholar or some, some uh, citation uh, index like that, um, you'll find that book has uh, rather more than 20,000 citations, uh, which is a, an indication that the, the work, uh, um, because that book is bringing together uh, a, a range of, of studies in the field, the work is now getting around uh, quite widely. Um, and I think we can, we can reasonably say that um, uh, it's not just that book, but there is a global circulation of the concepts that have been developing in the field of research on, on men and masculinities, and the, the models of understanding, the modes of understanding men's and boys' lives that, uh, that this research now underpins. So let me indicate a few more of the, the texts that, that have emerged. This is from India. Um, the work of Radhika Chopra, a field researcher, an ethnographer, um, who in this text brings together a range of Indian studies on different aspects of, of the lives of men and boys. Some very interesting work on education, for instance, in this book. Um, in Southeast Asia, um, there's also an increasing volume of, of research with its incredible cultural diversity, ethnic diversity, and uh, difficult politics of, of development. Uh, China, uh, too, becomes a, a site of uh, not just the importation of, of Western concepts, as the Chinese uh, would usually put it, uh, but of their own debates and discourse. This is the work of Fang Gang, one of the leaders of Chinese work. Uh, in, in this field. Um, so we're getting a, a genuinely global circulation. There's no region of the world now uh, <clears throat> in which uh, this kind of research and debate is lacking. But as the field matures and um, the, the scope of research and debate increases, there is, of course, more intellectual diversity in it. That's not just um, as a result of uh, cultural differences in, in different regions. There are genuine intellectual divergencies going on. Uh, a lot of the work uh, influenced by European post-structuralist ideas uh, focuses on the constructions of identity, sees masculinity basically as a form of identity, and thinks of gender as a domain of, of discourse. On the other hand, there's a, a social realist uh, approach, more connected with sociology, um, more prevalent, I think, in, in Latin America, in Australia, uh, in Africa, than perhaps than, than in North America, um, <clears throat> which is concerned with the, the material circumstances, with the institutionalization of, of, uh, of masculinities. Um, and with the connections of, of um, masculinity and changes in and tensions in masculinity with economic change. Um, but regardless of these divergent ideas in, in the field, one of the really striking features of the, the mature um, field of debate here is the significance of applied knowledge. So, information ideas about masculinities don't just remain among the researchers. They circulate, and they have been circulating, in fact, uh, 
throughout the history of the field, in fields of applied work, uh, for instance, uh, in education, uh, in work on the education of boys, uh, in health sciences, in work on men's health, which we produced a report on in Australia uh, just 20 years ago, um, and which is one of the more now more significant applied fields. Uh, in counselling, um, psychotherapy, uh, in criminology, given the predominance of, of men uh, in law breaking, especially violent forms of crime, and of course in the prevention of gender based violence, domestic violence, rape, and the like. In all of these areas, the field of research uh, has been feeding ideas, uh, conceptions, and information into applied work and making that more focused uh, and, and more realistic. Um, now, this wouldn't have been possible, I guess, uh, without a recognition uh, that a, a different kind of gender politics was possible as I was saying a few minutes ago. Um, so we also see at this time the emergence on, on a world scale of a progressive masculinity politics. A striking moment in that uh, comes in 2004 uh, at the United Nations when the Commission on the Status of Women uh, devotes a significant part of its, its uh, meeting to discussion, discussing the role of men and boys in achieving gender equality, uh, which then becomes the subject of publications out of United Nations agencies, which you can find online. And part of that was the writing of what remains, I think, the, the first and still probably the only uh, uh, general uh, policy statement on men, masculinities, and gender equality uh, on a world scale. But there is, however, a world scale of activism beyond the United Nations. So we now have a very wide range of non-government organisations which are involved in progressive work with men and boys um, in Latin America, as you know, in India, uh, around Southeast Asia, uh, and even in in East Asia. And these, uh, again, as I'm sure most people at the conference know, <coughs> are linked globally through the Men Engage Network, which now has something like 600 member organisations in different parts of the world. So that's the, in, at any rate, my summary view, the, the state of the field as, as we see it now. Uh, but this is also the moment when we need to be thinking of a fairly basic intellectual change, uh, which has become possible as a result of developments outside this particular field, and which we now have to think through within it. This is the emergence of southern perspectives in the social sciences. And I'll have to go back a couple of steps in, in discussing this to point out that in in just about all areas of, of research, whether they're social science, humanities, physical sciences, mathematical sciences, we work in a global economy of knowledge um, with contributions from all over the world. Uh, this is a system for the production of knowledge and the exchange of, of knowledge, which has existed for hundreds of years, but not uh, in a homogeneous way. The global economy of knowledge has always been strongly structured in a form which dates back to the era of the old overseas European empires, in which the colonised world, what we now call the global south, has functioned as a huge data mine, so the colonies didn't just produce silver, cotton, sugar and slaves, they also produce data for the growth of, of knowledge. And the Global North, the Metropolitan Centre, becomes the centre for the accumulation of knowledge, the theorising of knowledge, the turning of data into organised uh, concepts, and the turning of 
theoretical science into applied sciences, which are then returned to the global periphery in the form of professional knowledge. That's a, a pattern which was created in the era of European empires, but which has persisted very strongly in the organisation of, of knowledge since formal decolonisation processes, which began a couple of hundred years ago. So it's still the case, and, and this applies even to new fields of, of gender studies. In, in, this applies even to new fields of knowledge like gender studies. So around the, the periphery of the world, uh, we naturally, it's almost taken for granted common sense way of proceeding, we read Simone de Beauvoir, Judith Butler, Joan Scott, uh, and the, the other theorists of the global north, we don't expect them to read us, and mostly they don't. Uh, it's not required in their practice of, of, uh, of as knowledge workers. Uh, so the global economy of knowledge thus has a, uh, a global division of labour. The theory, basically the enterprise of the global north, Data production, basically the enterprise of the global south. And yet we know the global south does make theory and has been making theory ever since colonization began. So there has been conceptualization, debate, theoretical argument going on about the process of colonization itself coming from colonized societies too. And that is the basis from which has grown post-colonial theory, decolonizing agendas, decolonial thought, what I call southern theory, the critique of the global economy of knowledge in its mainstream form. So in the light of, of southern theory and, and post-colonial and decolonial thought, um, you know, most of this work so far has been programmatic, I guess, pointing to uh, intellectual work that has been done in the Global South and suggesting new uh, frameworks, new epistemology, epistemological frameworks. But there hasn't been all that much substantive novelty, I think, in the perspectives. And this is where work on men and masculinities, I think, might be very significant in this whole debate. Because in this field, in our field, there are, in fact, a couple of really key points that have already emerged uh, which point to new ways of thinking about basic concepts in the field. The first is illustrated by the work of Robert Morrell in South Africa, who I've, I think I've already mentioned his uh, edited book. But this is his own monograph on the history of settler colonial masculinity in Natal, in southeastern Africa. In this work, this beautiful piece of, of historical research, he traced the creation of a hegemonic form of masculinity among the colonizers and showed that this was basically producing a pattern of masculinity that worked for the process of conquest and the consolidation of conquest. That is for the exertion of force for the rule over the colonised through the application of, of military force and then of, of police powers. In other words, what that is indicating is that a masculinity that was hegemonic among the colonisers did not at the same time represent a hegemonic uh, masculinity, a hegemonic situation in regard to the colonised, to the indigenous population who were in that context and still are in South Africa, the majority. So hegemony thus was called into question by this kind of research. And I, as I've recently begun to connect that with debates uh, around subaltern studies, particularly the work of Radajit Guha, the founding editor of that journal, Subaltern Studies, who published an important essay called dominance without hegemony, domination without hegemony, in which he argued that the British rule in India 
although it claimed hegemony, in fact did not have it. That the colonial rule of the British in India was essentially a product of colonising violence and sustained application of physical force, of military force, rather than the achievement of hegemony. And that has made me think that what we have tended to call, to assume about hegemonic masculinity, that it was the reproduction, that it was a means of reproduction of patriarchal gender relations over time. Hegemonic masculinity, in that sense, might be a special case rather than the typical case in gender relations worldwide. Now, I want to connect that with a second point, which also uh, emerges when we begin to, to connect Southern theory with gender studies. <clears throat> and this is a point that comes out of a, a range of, of work in Global South Feminism, going back uh, to the work of Heleat Safiotti in, in Brazil. Um, and, and the point is a, a, a simple one, but a profound one, that the historical construction of the modern gender order in colonial and post-colonial societies is a different historical process from the construction of the modern gender order in Europe and North America, precisely because it has the discontinuity of colonization and the social discontinuities uh, that follow from colonization and colonial power as a central feature of the construction of gender orders. And this is represented in research on masculinities, for instance, by the research of Mara Viveros, who I understand is also with you at the conference, uh, showing the profound racialization of gender relations in post-colonial contexts in Latin America. And the same is true, of course, in other parts of the world and comes out in that international research from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and very conspicuously in Africa. So here I would connect uh, what's happening has, has emerged in our field with the arguments of Anibal Kihano uh, about the coloniality of power, the persistence in the post-colonial period of structures of power and authority, institutionalised structures, which have continuity with the power structures of the colonial era itself. And I want to connect that or apply that concept within the field of gender dynamics itself. So what this does, <coughs> basically, is led to a revised view of hegemonic masculinity, not as a means of social reproduction, of the simple reproduction of a consolidated patriarchal gender order, but rather seeing hegemonic masculinity always as a project of attempting to achieve hegemony in a social context where hegemony may in fact be lacking. More than that, I'd argue that hegemonic masculinity, understood in this way, is always a collective project of the powerful, interwoven with class and race relationships, and always imperfect. We must recognise that the achievement of hegemony is always under stress, always partial, always open to contestation, and indeed always containing internal tensions which may bring certain patterns of masculinity to, to a crisis or to an end. And that's the approach I want to bring into contemporary uh, analysis, looking at forms of, of masculinity and the politics of masculinity in the world today. So when we look at the very conspicuous examples of, of political, politicised masculinity around the world, Trump, Bolsonaro, Putin, Modi. Are we looking at hegemonic masculinity? We're certainly looking at patriarchal masculinities here. But hegemonic? I doubt it. I think what we're looking at in these cases, rather, is a kind of restoration project. A masculinity interwoven 
with a project of establishing new authoritarian forms of rule, but one that lacks established cultural hegemony and therefore must mobilize racism, religion, fear of alternative forms of gender, all of these features that really characterize the new authoritarian populism and create puzzles for understanding them if we don't recognize the, the, the fragility, in fact, that underlies them. This indeed is fragility. Uh, <clears throat> I think underlies the intensity of lying and distortion that accompanies the new authoritarianism, the fake news that, that is constantly pouring out of, of these mobilizations, to me is a measure of their cultural weakness, not their strength. And um, it is, is very much an arena in which contestation is possible. Now, there are, of course, specific gender campaigns, the anti-gender campaign, uh, with Catholic uh, activism uh, involved in countries like France and Colombia, homophobic mobilizations, very conspicuous in East Africa, femicide, the killing of, of visible women uh, in, in Iraq, uh, anti-feminist uh, actions such as the arrests of, of uh, a feminist activists recently in China. Uh, these two, I think, all signify uh, <clears throat> attempts uh, at, at uh, repressing uh, uh, progressive mobilizations and, uh, and, and signify the, the fragile legitimacy um, of the, the uh, restoration projects. So, despite the apparent uh, upsurge of, of authoritarianism, uh, the struggle continues, as the Italians say, lotta continua, um, and new forms of struggle are needed in, in this world where, in some ways, the, the neoliberal consensus has been lost. Uh, these authoritarianisms are not classic neoliberalism, uh, though they may in some ways be more dangerous to, uh, for instance, in, in nuclear uh, politics. Uh, and as long as the struggle continues, we need the kind of research uh, that has been being done around men and masculinities and, and will continue to be done. We need to document the contemporary realities of men's lives and patterns of masculinity. We do need to understand them in new ways, as I've been arguing. Latin America has been seen uh, some of the most creative research in this field anywhere in the world. You can take that, I think, as established fact. Gender in, about gender relations generally, about men and masculinity specifically. And I'm sure that will continue into the future. So I wish you all the best for the conference and for the research that will be continuing from it. Best wishes for your work now. Thank you.